Yeah. Well, good morning, everybody. Nice to see all of you. For you folks that are watching this on video, we're glad you joined us. And I want to let you know that now is a good time for you to uh, pause this. And if you have the lesson notes that have been sent to you, print them out so you'll be ready when the lesson starts. Usually about this time I introduce the visitors and I was going to introduce to you to uh, Joe and Janelle Long. <laughs> Turns out they're members of the class. They just haven't been here in a little while. <laughs> we're so happy to be here. That's, well, we're glad to have you. Uh, a few announcements. Leadership equipping is tonight. So if you attend our leadership equipping, it will start in the worship center. And at about 5.30 or so, we'll go into the fellowship hall. You heard this morning in the service, October the 23rd, which is Saturday, 8 a.m. in fellowship hall, we're going to have a, the men's breakfast. And the speaker will be James Walker. The uh, tickets are on sale in the ministry gallery, $3 in advance, $5 at the door. It's usually a really interesting time, and, and it's a good breakfast, so uh, I encourage you to come. And uh, I don't know if, uh, if any of you in here are pistol or rifle shooters, but uh, be sure to mark your calendars for the men's shooting event on Saturday, November the 6th. It will be at Quail Creek Shooting Range in North Lake. They have a private pistol range arranged from... Uh, uh, 8 till 10 a.m. cost is $20. So if you're interested in that, you might put that on your calendar. And also, in marking your calendars, mark your calendars for December the 3rd. That will be our annual Christmas party. It will be right here in this room. It will be catered. And as usual, knowing the ladies that are in charge of planning this, it's going to be a lot of fun. So uh, this is just a, kind of an advance notice so you can get it on your calendars. You'll get more details as we get closer to December on, uh, on the cost and uh, time such as that. Let me bring up one thing that uh, I usually take a lot of uh, notes and I'm kind of goofy with data. So as far as our class goes, we have right now 108 official members of our class. But there are a number of those people that are homebound and there's just not in any way they're going to make it. However, if we had everybody in here that could attend, we'd have 77 people. And if you look around, I don't think we're nearly approaching 77. I would encourage you to subtly, with your friends that you know from class, to, to encourage them to come back to class. I know it's easy to stay home in your pajamas with your cup of coffee and watch whatever you want uh, as far as a worship service on TV, but you are uh, neglecting getting together in a joint worship service and their strength in the joining together of God's people. So that's all I'm going to say about that. Anyone have anything they'd like to bring up? Did anybody say anything about the October the 31st from the tree? From the tree. From the tree. From the tree. No. No. Ah, trunk or treat. That, okay. Yeah, I mentioned it last week, didn't mention it this week, but you're right. It's uh, from four to six. Uh, Sunday, October the 11th, and it will be in the Wellness Center parking lot. Mm -hmm. And we're going to do it. What's we're going to be involved? Yes. We're going to have one? Okay. Yes. Good. So we'll bring candy next Sunday. Okay. Do we need to check with anybody to... Okay. Check with Romel if you're going to participate in that. What was the date again? Yeah. 31st. 31st, 4 to 6. Okay, well, I'm going to check and see if any of you really know your Bible. Okay. What kind of a man was Boaz before he married Naomi's daughter-in-law? Ruthless. Absolutely. <laughs> Did you get it? He was ruthless. 
What do we call pastors in Berlin? German shepherds. <laughs> what kind of motor vehicles are mentioned in the Bible? Well, Andy, it's sure good to have you. Okay, well, you, but my watch is a little off sometimes, too. Jehovah drove Adam and Eve from the garden in a fury. In what? Fury. In a fury. Yes, in a fury. David's triumph was heard throughout the land. And the apostles left their gathering in one accord. So now you know. Richard will know this. What Bible character had no parents? Parents. Joshua, son of Nun. And the last one, this is kind of like Karnak, and everybody would applaud Johnny Carson when he said this is the last one. Which Bible, uh, excuse me, which servant of God was the most flagrant lawbreaker? What? Say it again. Which servant of God was the most flagrant lawbreaker? Moses. He broke all of them at the same time. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Richard, come introduce us to the book of Colossians. Yeah, if you were, um, if you were here a couple of weeks ago, I told you about raising our kids and how we always had a Bible verse at supper time and uh, how we how we learned uh, was it you Andy was it you or was it Kim that read out of the book of Filipinos read out of Filipinos and then a couple of weeks later we read out of the book of Galatians so consequently today today we're going to Begin a review from the book of Colossians, or as we would say it around our house, Colossians. So let me go. Man, I'm having a I'm having a hard time here with my notes. Oh, I got it. I think we're in good shape. Everybody have a copy of the handout? Everybody have a copy of the handout? Okay. Good, 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 good. Well, let's do a little review. For the last uh, four weeks, we've been studying in the book of Filipinos, in the book of Phil Philippians. And uh, what I'm going to do today is something rather unusual. The book of Philippians is only four chapters. But in my humble, in my humble but most accurate opinion, the book of Philippians is just one of the greatest books to study in the New Testament. Only four chapters. There was a time in my life, back uh, probably 40 years ago, when on a regular basis I would read the book of Philippians once a week. I mean, you can sit down and read it in 30 minutes. And so I found the book of Philippians to be very, very instructional. It's a great book for memory verses. And what I've done is put in your in your handout, some memory verses, but I've even, I've even asked John, I said, John, is there any way that we can get a sampling of these memory verses on the board? So here is a sampling of some of the memory. How many did I put in front of you? One, two, three, four, five, about 10. Put 10 in front of you, and we're going to look at, uh, at four or five of those. So looking, you know, at Philippians, Sam, this is yours right here. Philippians 1, 6. You see that? Philippians 1, 6. Being confident of this very thing that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Why is that so important? Is there any way that, uh, you know, we can slip out of God's hand before the work is completed? What do we call this? We call this the security of the believer, a confirmed word. And then looking Philippians 121, this is the key to Philippians for me to for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. A couple of more here, just read. And this, again, this passage out of Philippians, let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus, who thought it not robbery uh, to be equal with God. 
I mean, this is great stuff right here. And it goes on. Being found in the appearance as man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Therefore, there, and why, why is that therefore there? For is because Jesus humbled himself. Therefore, God has highly exalted him, giving him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, those in heaven, those in earth, and under the earth, and that every tongue would confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is good stuff here. These are all in Philippians. And those verses are just put right Here's another one. Oh, oh, that I may know him and the power of of his resurrection. More I love that verse. And then 13 to 14, brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but what we do, we forget those things which are behind us. We talked about that, didn't we? We forget those things which are behind us and we press on, to move ahead forward. I press toward the goal of the price of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And then these last two, uh, Philippians 4, 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord. You know that, don't you? Duh, duh, duh. There it is. Philippians 4, 4. Philippians 4, 6. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in perfect pieces. These are just a sampling of some of those. Well, there, there's the last one. Finally, there it is. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true. My little brother, and that was his favorite passage, right? And he learned the formula. Whatsoever things are true, pure, just. Think, think on these things. Think on these things. Well, again, there's a sampling, but I put in your handout <clears throat> all the scripture references. <coughs> Uh, that are found in Philippians. But the thing that I wanted to emphasize, the book of Philippians, only four chapters, only four chapters, but rich, rich stuff in those four chapters. And here are some memory verses I would, I would really submit to you. In your handout, you also have, you know, every now and then, every now and then, it surprises me that I, the Lord gives me a thought. And I can tell you that what you're looking at next on your handout is something that the Lord just popped into my mind one morning when I was reading, that the price of the gospel is the crucifixion. And by the way, did the price, did he just pay part of it at the crucifixion? Did Jesus only pay part of the price? No, he paid it all. So the price of of the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ is in the crucifixion, but the power of the gospel is in the resurrection. And so consequently, uh, I, I love those two little lines. And one morning I was just sitting there reading and it just came to me the, with two Ps, the price and the power. So it's right there. Well, that's a review that we see from the book of uh, Philippians. But today we begin the book of Colossians. And as I told you, when I was a mild-mannered reporter at the Daily Planet, uh, one of the things that I learned as a mild-mannered reporter that in your first paragraph, you ought, you ought to always use the who, what, when, why, where. And to my amazement in reading Colossians, in the first seven or eight verses, we have the who, what, when, why, where, and those introductions are in the first eight verses. So here they are, and I'm going to read, is, do we have it up here? Is it up here too? Uh, it's right here in your handout, the first eight verses. It starts Colossians 1, 1 to 8, Paul, an apostle of Christ, Jesus, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to God's holy people in Colossae, the faithful brothers and sisters in Christ, grace and peace to you from God our Father. We always thank God, the, the Father of our Lord Jesus, when we pray for you, because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love you have for God's people and the faith and the love that spring from the hope is stored up in you in heaven and about uh, which you have already heard the true message of the gospel that's come to you. In the same way, 
In the same way, the gospel is bearing fruit and growing throughout the whole world, just as it's been doing among you since the day we heard it, since the day you heard it and truly understood God's grace. You learned it from, by the way, this guy's name, I'm pronouncing it, Epfras, Epfras, Epifras, Epifras, E-P-A, Epa, P-H-R-A-S, Epifras, our dear fellow servant who is faithful minister of Christ on, on behalf. He also told us about the love of the Spirit. So we have the who and the where and the when. Who wrote the book of Colossians? Paul with, uh, with Timothy. And what? He wrote, I mean, where? He was in prison at the time that he wrote this, but it's to the church that was at Colossae. And uh, when he wrote it, he wrote it while he was in prison. And so consequently, we have the who, the where, and the when. Now, what about the what and the why? This is one of the four epistles written by Paul. And it was written to the congregation in the town of Colossae, believers he had never met. By the way, he didn't start this church. Uh, he, he was instrumental in starting the work uh, in Philippi, which ended up with the Philippians, but he'd, he'd, he'd never met these people. And we're going to find that all throughout the book. And so, for the, and he wrote it for the purpose of encouragement and doctrine and confirmation of their pastor, the guy whose name is weird, Epaphras. And a little more about the Colossian church. The Apostle Paul spent two years at a church in Ephesus, and, uh, and we read about that in Acts. But while he was there, uh, apparently the word of the gospel went out all over Asia Minor. Now, whether Paul himself fanned out and started uh, this church in Colossae, we really don't know, but apparently it was, uh, it was Ep Epaphras who was very instrumental. The purpose of this letter, and by the way, just to, I mean, boy, I love this pointer. Look at here. All right, you, you know, remember where Philippi is? And to show you this map, there was Philippi. That was where the, the church was in Philippians. That's where they were uh, in modern day. There is Istanbul. How many of you all have been to Istanbul? Yeah, I've been there too one, once upon a time. Istanbul. Istanbul is right there. And by the way, there is a bridge across there. And Istanbul is the only city in the world that is in two continents. Because down here, it's the continent of Africa and, and Asia. And up here, this is Europe. And so Istanbul today is the only city in the world that is situated in two continents. This is called the Bosphorus. There's Troas, they called it, you know, we know the story of Troy. Here is Ephesus. So while Paul was at Ephesus, you see some of these other churches, but look at here. Here is Colossae right here. So this is where these folks were meeting that uh, this letter was intended to, to uh, impact. So let's learn a little more. I'll just leave that up so you can see that. But the purpose of the letter, look at this. The letter to the Colossians is believed to have been written by Paul from prison sometime around 60 to 62 AD. You remember there are four prison epistles, Philippians, Colossians, Philemon, and Ephesians. At that time, Paul and Nero was the cruel and insane emperor. And by the way, Paul was martyred not too long after he wrote these letters. From prison, Paul had heard about the Colossian Christians who had at one time been strong in their faith, but now were vulnerable to deception. And we're going to learn more about this as we read the book of Colossians. Uh, they were strong people, but a little group you see in the next uh, sentence we call Judaizers. Now, what's a Judaizer? A Judaizer is just one of those guys that got into the church and said, you know, being a Christian is fine. Being a Christian is all well and good, but you need to practice a lot of the Jewish law. And so in addition to 
introducing and having Jesus as their Savior and Lord, the Judaizers said, you know, you need to be circumcised. You need to keep the festivals. You need to do this. You need to do that. And so they were saying being a Christian is one thing and trusting Jesus is all well and good, but you need to do other stuff. Now, what does that remind you of, huh? You need to do other stuff. They were called Judaizers. So Paul is writing the book of Colossians to the church in Colossae with the, with the thought in mind that, folks, it's Jesus and only Jesus. And we're going to see a snippet of that today because the Judaizers are trying to say, oh, you know, you got to have Jesus plus something. But it, he's going to say to them, eh, it's Jesus plus nothing. And so the book of Colossians was written uh, for the purpose of straightening out those people. Well, today we need to look at something. Here's a question for you. Que question for you. You ever thought about this? When did Jesus first show up in the world? Huh? When did he first show up in the world? Not quite yet. Not quite yet. <laughs> when did he first show up? Was it at Bethlehem? Huh? I'm looking. Was it at Bethlehem? Is this when Jesus first showed up? Well, in our passage today, in our passage today, we're going to focus on these particular verses. And read along, read along while we just share the focal passages for today. And it's found in Colossians chapter 1, verses 9 to 20. We'll read along as we I read it out loud to you. Here's our focal passages. For this reason, since the day we heard about you, you see that? See, he'd never been there. He'd heard about him, but he'd never been there. We have not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives so that you might live a life and walk worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you might have great endurance and patience and giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. For he has delivered us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption and the forgiveness of sin. Now, a couple of key points in looking at that passage. Number one, he's saying, he's saying basically, you know, I've heard about you. I heard about you, and I really like what I've heard. And I put in here, wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't that be wonderful, you know, to have the Lord say to you, and one of these days he will, when he says, well done good and faithful servant. But Paul is saying, you know, even though I've never met you all in Colossae, I've heard about you. And boy, I really like what you hear. Then he goes on from verses 9 to 14, and he says something else. He said, boy, when I think about you all, I pray for you. And notice what he prays for, because he talks about four things in his prayer. And I guess you kind of have to use both eyes, one eye on this, one eye over here on this. And so he's saying to them, number one, I'm praying that you would be filled with knowledge and wisdom and understanding in the Holy Spirit. That's important. We need to be filled with knowledge and understanding of the Holy Spirit. Number two, he said, I'm praying that you'd walk worthy of the Lord. And he says that in about verse uh, 10. And then he says that you would be strengthened by his power. And finally, he says that you would give thanks to God for your salvation and deliverance from darkness. 
And so his prayer for the church in Colossae was fourfold. Number one, that they would have knowledge in the Holy Spirit, that, that they would work, work, walk worthy of the Lord and be strengthened with his power and that they would give thanks for the salvation that they enjoy because they've been delivered from darkness. A great prayer, fourfold prayer. Well, we move to verse 15. Verse 15, you remember the question? When did Jesus first show up? You remember that? And I said, well, he first showed up at Bethlehem. Well, the more I got to reading this, it's not true. Not true. Look at what verse 15 says. That the sun, the sun is the, in, the image of the invisible God. He is the firstborn of all creation. For in him all things were created. Things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Were the thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things. There's the answer to our question. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn among the dead. That means he was the first resurrection. That's his resurrection. So that in everything he might have supremacy. Verse 19, for God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. And a couple of key points. Number one, Paul explains the preeminence. The word preeminence means supremacy. When did Jesus show up on the scene? At the very beginning. He has been, he has been, he is, and he will be. That's the preeminence of Jesus. Well, tell you what, instead of me trying to explain what we have just read, there's a guy by the name of Louis Giglio. He's going to kind of help us walk through this and explain exactly what we have just read. Let's hear what old Louis has to say about all this, okay? Long story short, the tour was winding down. Last time around, we were in Tyler, Texas. The night was over. A guy walks up to me. I wish I could tell you the whole story. So, let's go. Introduces himself to me. He says, how are you doing? I just want to say hello. I said, it's nice to meet you. He says, you guys wanted the tour down. Uh, where are you going to go from here? I said, well, I'm on my way back home to Atlanta, Georgia. He said, well, what's next for you? I said, you're going to be preaching the next two Sundays for my pastor back in Atlanta. He said, oh, cool. What are you preaching on? I said, well, the series is on the glory of God, the human body. He said, that's really amazing. I'm a molecular biologist at the university down the road. G give me your talk. And I was like, oh, wow. I wasn't quite yet ready to unload the talk for a molecular biologist. So I kind of stumbled through what I had and he's kind of being kind and gracious and like, uh-huh, that's good. And then he says, well, what's your big left hook? You gotta have a left hook, a big finish, right? I said, I don't have a left hook yet. He said, oh, Louie. Oh man, your left hook is laminin. And I, I'm totally blank on laminin. He goes, Louie, it's a cell adhesion molecule. A protein molecule? Do you know about proteins? I'm like, no. He said, look, cells organize into certain molecular structures, and that determines what protein there are. There are between 10 and 60,000 proteins in the human body. We don't even know how many proteins are in the human body. But one of them is a cell adhesion molecule. It's organized into this certain structure, and that tells the cell what its job is in the body. And this one is a cell adhesion molecule. I'm like, all right. He said, no, Louis. It's like the rebar of the human body. The steel they put the concrete when they lay the foundations of things. It's that stuff. It's, it's holding your membranes together. It's the glue of the human body, Louis. It's laminate. You've got to tell them about laminate. And I'm like, I promise you, I'm going home and tell them about laminate. And I'm sure when I do, revival is going to sweep across the church and probably 
go Google Lambin. I don't even know how to spell Lambin. <laughs> takes his card out and he writes in the back, L-A-M-I-N-I-N. -I -N -I -N. Okay, I cannot wait to get to my computer and get on Google, click on images, type in Lambin, and I'm waiting, and these little thumbnails come up on the screen, and I'm like, said, wow, wow, wow. And folks, you have just seen it. You have just seen it right there in front of you. To look back on that. <clears throat> he is before all things, Jesus, and in him all things hold together. How do they hold together? Through a little thing called laminin. Laminin. You're held together today by laminin. We, I'm held together today by laminin. And Jesus holds all things together through the cross, through his blood. When I saw this, and, and of course I, I think I shared this little video about five, six years ago. And to me, this is one of the greatest illustrations. I mean, it's hard for me to understand when did Jesus show up on the scene? He was there from the beginning. He was there from the beginning. And everything that was made was made for him and by him. And he holds everything together. Laminin. Great, a great illustration of who Jesus really is. Well, our little final passage for today is in verse 21. Look at this. Once 
You were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. But now, but now, he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body. We just heard about that. He shed his blood for us. By Christ's physical body, through death, to present you wholly in his sight, without blemish and free from accusation. A great picture of the before and the after of our lives. Before, we were alienated but he presented us holy. One of the greatest passages of scripture, I think that Paul wrote, gives a better picture of this in Ephesians 2. And you have Ephesians 2 on the next page. And you, Jimmy, John, Harry, Ann, you, he has made alive. You once were dead in your trespasses and your sins. I was there, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince, the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom we also once conducted ourselves in the lusts of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and you were by nature children of wrath, just as others. Two special words, but God, but God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he has loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, he has made us alive together with Christ. By grace you are saved and raised us up together and made us to sit in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Amen. Folks, you talk about the before and the after. There is an, another example of what we just read in Colossians. Remember in Colossians, you were once alienated. You were alienated from, from a living God. But he's made you holy by Christ Jesus to allow you to sit in the presence of God. One of these days we will do that very thing. So Jesus has done all of this because of his blood that he shed on the cross. And he holds everything together. Don't forget the word laminin. One of these days, somebody's going to say to you, I, I wonder how the world holds together. I wonder how our bodies hold together. And you can say, folks, I know how. It's by a, a monocule called laminin. And by the way, it's in the form of a cross. His blood's for you. Well, I want to ask you a couple of questions in conclusion. Number one, do we fully understand the preeminence of Jesus? Do you fully understand that he was there from the beginning? He was there from the beginning. He didn't just show up at Bethlehem. He was there from the beginning and he holds everything together. And we learn today what that stuff is. Number two, what are some of the things that changed in your life? You saw the before and the after. Are the things in your life that changed after you really became a Christian? I'll tell you that that passage in Ephesians is a perfect example of who, who I was right there. I walked according to everything that I wanted to do, but I was made alive. And but now, I read once upon a time, when we say, but God, but God, is, it's an excuse. You know, have you ever, you know, the Lord is saying to me, and I say, but, 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 that's what Moses did. But God, I, st I stutter. But when he says, but God, it's a promise. So consequently, what are some of the things that have changed in your life? Number three, have you ever known or seen anyone that had a dramatic change in their lives after experiencing forgiveness? Andy here knows the name Wes Robbins. I shared with Wes Robbins when he was in an asylum. They had him locked up in a padded cell. They brought him out to me in what he called a love me jacket. One of these. 
a straight jacket. I shared the Lord with him first time. Came back a week later. They had him out of the love me jacket. Shared the Lord with him again. Right there in the asylum called Sandia. Sandia it had another name in by the hospital, Sandia Hospital. He accepted the Lord and was saved, as he says, from his radiator to his taillights. Have you ever met anybody that way? That when they got saved, they got saved from the radiator to the taillights. When they let him out of the hospital about three weeks later, first Sunday, he came to our church. Invitation, he ran down the aisle. Wes was 26 years old, had been an alcoholic since he was 12 years old. He was in that straight jacket because he'd, he'd been experiencing DTs for 30 days. 30 days DTs, that's where you see stuff. Things, bugs crawling on you, etc. When the Lord set him free, he got free. He joined everything in the church. He joined the choir. I can remember our, oh, I thought about this, Vivian. His first Sunday in choir, we sang at the name of Jesus, right out of Philippians. And at the conclusion of that, it's got a good World War II ending on it. And boy, at the conclusion of that, everyone in church were just quiet except for one person. And in the back row in the choir loft, I heard, Yahoo! <laughs> Only about 10 times that loud. Guess who it was? It was Wes. Do you know why he was yahooing? Because he had realized that he had been set free, absolutely free. Wes was wild. He was wild as a March hare. And when I think of people, the before and the after, the picture that I see in my mind is Wes Robbins. So I answer that question, have you ever seen anyone? Yeah. And I hope you have too, to see someone that's experienced that. Number four, wouldn't you love to experience that refreshing and cleansing again today in your life? Wouldn't you, wouldn't you like to experience the freshness of just being saved and realizing that all of those things in back of you are gone, are gone, washed away, cleansed? Well, you can. In Psalm 51, David talks about that. Oh, when he says, create in me a clean heart, oh God, and renew in me a right spirit. He didn't say, save me again. He said, I've just lost the joy of my salvation. And there it is in Psalm 91. And secondly, or thirdly, or fourthly, or fifthly, Paul said to the church at Colossae, I pray that you would walk worthy. What does, what does that look like, walking worthy? Well, he talks about the fact that in walking worthy, we remember, we remember what God has done for us and who he is and he want, what he wants to do. And so I pray that today, that in realizing who Jesus is, who he was, and who he wants to be in all of our lives, that we, along with old Wes, can say, Yahoo, we've been set free. And our lives are being held together. Our bodies are being held together by that little molecule called laminin. Never heard of it prior to this. But wonderful, wonderful thing to picture who Jesus really is in our lives. And so consequently, as we study the book of Colossians, folks, this is the stuff that we're going to be looking at. It's going to be good stuff. And I hope that uh, you will come to know afresh and anew who Jesus is and wants to be in our lives because Paul was talking about that. Well.